everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm going to call the Carson City School District Board of Directors or Board of Trustees meeting to order. Joe Ulias in the flag salute. Moving on to number two, adoption of the agenda is submitted for possible action. So moved. Second. Any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Moving on to number three, superintendent's report for information only. Mr. Stokes. Thank you, Madam President. Members of the board, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. We have some special guests with us. I am pleased to recognize students and staff from Pioneer High School. And uh, I would like to turn a little time over at this time to Phyllis Atkinson, who is the site's sponsor of the HOSA program at Pioneer. I also would like to recognize that Mr. Jason Zona, the principal at the school, is here this evening. So Mrs. Atkinson, if you'll come forward with your students, please. Scary. You don't have to hold it. It never was like this before. I don't know. <laughs> I'm Phyllis Atkinson, and I teach uh, CTE program at Pioneer High School. And these are three of our students here tonight. Um, just want to let you know a little bit about our program at Pioneer. Uh, we have the health science uh, cluster at Pioneer. We have health science one. Health Information Management 1, and Health Information Management 2. We have about 15 kids involved in that three, those three areas. Um, three of them are here tonight. They're here tonight because we took six kids to Las Vegas uh, last week for a conference for a student or for a state leadership conference with HOSA, which is for Future uh, Healthcare Workers of America. So these three competed in different areas. We didn't bring home any gold this year, but we five of our six kids were first time at the conference. And so they're going to tell you a little bit about what they competed in, and if they have anything else of what you did down there, we can add that too. Who wants to go? Casey? Okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Casey Beaufort, and... The one I participated in was healthy lifestyle. Uh, it, we just kind of did stuff about like exercise, fitness. Uh, yeah, that's kind of like just that stuff, just health, like about your body and stuff. That's all really. Uh, I participated in the quiz. I made it to second round. Did not get, bring any back any place. Yeah. I'm Ryan Vega, and I participated in medical assisting. And um, I did not make it to the second round, unfortunately, but it's my first time going. It was great. Went to symposiums. That was also great. So, um, Hello, I'm Jade Lynn Skinnador. This is actually my third year competing in HOSA. Um, I did medical assisting this year. I made it past the first round, but I didn't do that well on the second round. I get very nervous in front of people, as you may notice. <laughs> so, uh, the symposiums were like really fun. We went to a new one called uh, Sketch Noting. That was very interesting. So, it was pretty fun this year. I'm going to add one more thing, too, with Jade. Um, and she's, she is kind of a person that doesn't like the attention, but we're going to give it to her now. Uh, Jade is third year. Uh, recently, she's had to take a couple of exams. The first one was on workplace readiness. She passed that just fine. Then she had to take the health information management final exam. She did great there. And she did so great that there are about 13 kids in the district that took that exam, and she scored highest. So we're really proud of her. She made third year. <laughs> I think that sums it up. Any questions? Joe? 
I just wanted to say congratulations. I mean, placing and making it to the rounds and, you know, winning it all, if you're that lucky, is all great. But that's kind of the bonus of the whole thing, the icing on the cake. You still get the cake, you know, participating in this is really what it's all about. I mean, you're getting exposed to something that is not just a school activity. It truly is something you could, if you were interested in it, can take, you know, take on, say, you know, through your future academic studies in college and then, you know, into a career. We were just at Arizona State University last weekend, and HOSA was on that campus. They gave us a presentation. Um, you know, and my, my son was involved in it when he was in college. And so it goes on, you know, well beyond high school. And it's, you know, it's what I'm trying to say is it's real. And the experience you're getting is real experience. So, you know, enjoy the value in that and, you know, work hard. And if you get something great, but, you know, I think we're all proud of, you know, what you were exposed to and, you know, what you accomplished. So nice job. And another great thing that was down there is being able to meet all the other kids from across the state. A lot of them are all, all really kind. And talking to people like 6 a.m. at Starbucks lines. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, congratulations. And just to back up with Ms. what Joe said, we are so proud of you guys. And just to show up and be there and represent Pioneer High in Carson City, we really appreciate it. And Jade, it must be paying off because you don't look real nervous. So I think it's actually working for you. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. We appreciate the update. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, members of the board, I just have one little reminder for you that Bandorama will be this Thursday, and that will be held at Carson High School. It starts at 7 o'clock. If you, however, would like to come a little early for dinner, the uh, administrators have suggested that we... Uh, RSVP for that event, which starts at 6. And so if you need help doing that, just give me a shout, and I'd be happy to help. And that's my report. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Going on to the Dapper Mr. Casey, Pioneer High. Hello. Uh, so last week, six Pioneer students attended the HOSA Student Leadership <laughs> Conference. <laughs> oh, we just talked about that one. <laughs> yeah. It was a great experience, and the students learned a lot. On March 16th, Five JAG students from Pioneer attend a career development conference in Reno where they learn more about leadership and career skills. In addition, Amanda Nichols placed third, third in the performing arts category for her poetry. On March 14th, Anahi Pachico was recognized at the art ceremony at the Nevada Museum of Art. Congratulations to Ms. Atkinson and Ms. Ward for being the Pioneer High School Employees of the Year. On March 20th, JAG student Kaya Burdett Toward the state legislature, Kaya was able to meet Senator, uh, do not know how to pronounce his name, and Governor Slowski. There's a field, <laughs> I missed that one of balls. Sisolak, okay. There's a field trip to Mesa Rim Climbing Center on April 5th. Students, don't forget that April 1st is an early release day, and April 6th is a professional development day. Piner High School would like to extend a special thanks to Q&D Construction for all of their hard work. Our, camp, our campus is looking wonderful, and all of you have done amazing jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Ryan from Carson High. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Ryan Lawler, and I'm the um, student body school board representative for Carson High School. Um, senior project day at Carson High School is April 8th, which is a Monday, and they need judges for the 12 o'clock noon time slot. Project review is happening now. And um, if you'd like, you can contact Melissa Kunter at 775-283-1640 for more information or to volunteer. And spring break will be the 15th through the 22nd of April. And the father-daughter ball put on in collaboration with um, FBLA and the student council at Carson High School will be the 26th of April in the big gym, which is a Friday. And the tickets will be $40 per couple and $10 for each additional daughter. And the senior prom will be the following night, same place, um, Saturday, April 27th at 7 p.m. And that concludes my report. Can't believe prom's right around the corner. Mrs. Crossman for okay, board for reports. Okay, for Elementary School, Mr. Brown would like to remind all the parents again to come and check the lost and found because this is the last call. Friday, they're bagging everything up, and you'll have to go buy it at Fritch. I mean, not at Fritch. At Fish if you um, don't pick it up. So... Go check through and see what you're missing. Um, for Fremont Elementary School, the PTA is going to be hosting a mother-son dance, 
which is kind of nice because I never get to go to father-daughter ones. I mean, yeah, I, my husband doesn't either. But anyway, it will be April 12th at the Governor's Mansion and from 6 to 8, and the cost is $20 per couple, and an extra son is $5. Um, so you can purchase them at Fremont March 26th and 27th, cash or check only, or April 6th. You can go buy that if you'd like to. So anyway, that's going around, and there's information on that. So, and for NASB, an update on that. This week, we're reviewing some 50 bills and more dropped, and there's lots and lots of bills out there. They're not done yet. Um, so that's where we're at, and I guess um, I'll just let you as a board know that the executive committee met and has interviewed, gone through multiple rounds of interviews, and has selected a candidate to be um, submitted to the board of directors for approval as the new executive director. So if you have any questions, you can ask me, and hopefully the board of directors uh, makes that approval, and we have an announcement in a couple weeks. So we'll see. Um, but that concludes my report. Thank you. Richard? Yeah, for Board Rick Bray, they're conducting their teacher conferences this week, parent-teacher conferences today and tomorrow. They have nine teachers who are doing the APTT conferences. Uh, and yesterday, uh, Bordrick Bray had a play they put on, a wild, excuse me, um, it was Red Riding Hood. Uh, they The kids have been working on the play for about four separate days over uh, the last three or four weeks. And uh, I got to tell you, the kids, I was able to go and watch it. And the kids, for the small amount of practice they had, they did a terrific job, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, so it was really a fun time. For Carson Middle School, uh, they're going to participate in Bandorama naturally. And then uh, uh, Friday, this Friday, uh, they're participating in a choir festival in Churchill County. Some students are going to that. Then Monday, April 1st, um, i got to put my glasses on here so I can read what I wrote. Uh, it's an early out day at 1.20 p.m. They want everyone to know. And then April 3rd to the 4th, they're participating in all state music festival in Las Vegas. And then Monday, April 8th, they want everybody to know that uh, there's no school that day for professional development for teachers. And that's my report. Thank you. Lupe? I don't have any report re related to med schools, but I do want to... Um, publicly thank uh, Mr. Stokes for attending a uh, meeting at the college um, last week with a, a group of parents that we have. Um, it's a Latino parent committee that we have, and their name is Puente, and I can tell you in Spanish and in English what the acronym st stands for. It's Padres Unidos, Educándonos Como Nuestros Estudiantes Pueden Triunfar Hacia la Excelencia. That means Parents United Learning How Our Children uh, how we can educate our children so they can succeed toward excellence. So it's a wonderful mission that this committee has, and they invite um, individuals from the community or from the school district to um, share with these parents about their programs so that they can um, better um, educate their, their children and get them, get them prepared to be successful. So, Mr. Stokes, thank you for coming and talking to these parents. Um, Dr. Solis was very grateful also, so thank you. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Joe? Uh, a couple things. Uh, Greater Nevada Credit Union is offering a prom package. Um, so all Carson High seniors get a chance to win $230, which pays for their tickets, um, gives them a nice floral arrangement, and a $100 gift certificate to Adele's. So if you're looking to impress your date, <laughs> not a <laughs> bad a deal. Way, way to go. Um, so I think I'm just reading it here. Um, does the contest started and all entries are due by 1 p.m. on April 5th. So it's a nice opportunity. Uh, tonight I got a chance to attend the Senior uh, Academic Awards, which was um, not a presentation, just kind of a gathering, if you will, but it was real nice. You know, you got to see the, the, the seniors coming by, getting their awards, interacting. All the parents were taking their pictures, but it was a... It was a nice, uh, you know, nice, nice hour we were there. Mr. Stokes was there, and we got to catch up and talk to some people, and uh, it was enjoyable. And then just to reiterate, senior projects, um, that's going on now, judges' reviews. I went and reviewed my five packets today, and they're always good. Um, there, was one, there was one, I actually wish I could catch up to the person who wrote it, 
because I have to say I don't really even understand what she did it, in a good way. It was that good. It was on psychology, and what she was looking for was over my head. So it was, um, you know, what the students are doing is 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 um, interesting. I really like the senior projects because, you know, the, the students that give it a little bit of time and use it for what it's intended to be, it's really a nice learning tool. You know, you're not just walking in taking a test. You're actually putting forth some time into something you're interested in and, you know, digging deeper into it, learning more about it. So I just wanted to congratulate all the seniors for completing it and uh, encourage them not to be too too nervous about the oral presentations. You'll do just fine. That's my report. Thank you. Mike? No report this evening. Okay. I have a report from Eagle Valley Middle School. The Eagle Valley students raised $312 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society through their penny drive. Seventh grade raised the most money, so the reward will be a non-SSA hoodie day on Friday, March 29th. Our choir, orchestra, and band students are competing at the zone competitions this week, and we want to wish them good luck. The PTO Bingo Night will be held Tuesday, April 2nd from 5.30 to 7. Everyone is welcome with fabulous prizes to be awarded. Bingo tickets are only a dollar each, and hot dogs and chips will be served free of charge by the PTO. They have a gate showcase that will be held April 10th from 4 to 6. This is an informal meet and greet for the gate students' parents to observe some of the great gate activities their children have created this year. And registration has begun for all grade levels, and our counselors are visiting our elementary feeder schools to register the fifth graders. And on a side note, a group of Eagle Valley teachers are volunteering their time to tutor students in an after-school homework club because of the funding that was cut by Read by Three, and they are giving their own time. So we thank them for that. It's well appreciated. Um, I had the NIAA spring meeting last week in Vegas. And just to remind AJ, I told you in September, but just to remind you that it's going up 25 cents per athlete or student, however they do the membership dues. Um, the other big news was Dayton football was granted independent status. And the new president for the next two years is Roland Stallworth out of Washoe. And the VP is Pam Sloan out of Clark. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to do is to congratulate Joan Ebert, our new state superintendent of education. We're looking forward to working with her. I, had the, uh, I got to meet her when she was working for Clark County school district and she took me through a couple schools while I was down there and she's very knowledgeable I think at least it'll be somebody that has some idea of what education is and what kind of funding it takes so that's kind of a, a good thing I think and I thank the governor for that pick and that concludes my report moving on to association reports seeing none we will move on to number six public comment Comments can be made by the members of the public on any manner within the authority of this board. Please note that public comment will be taken on items marked for possible action before action is taken on such items and members of the public are encouraged to comment on such items at that time that they are being considered. Although members of the board may respond with questions and discuss issues raised during public comment, no action may be taken on such a matter until the matter is placed on an agenda for action at a meeting of the board. In making public comment, speakers are asked to come to the podium Sign in, speak into the microphone, and identify themselves for the record. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to no more than three minutes and simply not to repeat comments made by others. Is there any public comment at this time? Thank you. Seeing none, we'll move on to number seven, discussion and possible action to approve the adoption of the 2019 6 through 12 World Language Arts Material French and Spanish for the Carson City School District as budgeted. This is for possible action. Mrs. Kima. Susan Kima for the record. Tonight, Mrs. Cynthia Mills, our 6 through 12 ELA English Language Arts Implementation Specialist, and I are happy to present to you selected materials for our district's middle and high school world language courses. Tonight, we will be featuring French and Spanish. American Sign Language is also a world language that we will be presenting to you at a later date. I'm here to testify that the selection process has followed the NRS and NAC 390 requirements, and it should be noted for the record that we did not have any additional community members review the materials. Per your approval, both these products is slated for the state board approval on May 2nd. We're going to break it down into two parts, and we're going to talk. You have both French um, 
uh, the French product in front of you, and you also have the Spanish product in front of you. We're going to start talk briefly about French, and then because we have committee guests here, we'll talk a little bit more about Spanish. So I'd like to um, acknowledge the committee that selected the French materials for their work and dedication to this academic progress, a process. We have Sharon Miller, who is a French teacher at Carson High, that was on the committee. We have Kathy Yao, also a French teacher at Carson High, on the committee. Special thanks always goes to our parents. Uh, in this case, we actually had a school employee that was a parent on the committee. Her name is Cheryl Macy. You may be familiar with her. And we also had another parent. Her name was Mary Cummington, who has two children in our district. And you may have heard that name before because her husband helped us pick our physics materials. Um, so he, he, this is a family that's involved in, our in our, their children's education. Um, the book that we picked, or the, not me, we, the committee picked, is called Bien Dite for grades 9 through 12, French course classes, and it's by Houghton Mifflin Publishing Company. And though we don't have any committee members here for French this evening, um, uh, I'll turn it over to Cindy Mills for a few words. Okay, Cynthia Mills for the record. Um, so I am the ELA World Language Thank you. And um, I just, um, since Ms. Miller could not be here, um, I did take some notes on some of the highlights that she found um, in the Houghton Mifflin text that she, that blew her away and, and really made her want to adopt this product. Um, the scope and sequence, the way it was laid out, worked very well for French. And she compared that to um, an, another company that was in the running Vista, and she just felt that um, that scope and sequence made perfect sense for the French scope and sequence. And it just, and, and our Spanish teachers did adopt um, Vista, but for, for French, it just didn't, it didn't work as well for, for her and, and Ms. Yao. Um, it was nice that they had the two to collaborate and go through the materials. Ms. Yao also teaches Spanish, but she worked really, yeah, she worked with Sharon to, to help her, um, you know, go through all those materials. Um, some of the materials that the teachers looked at were from Pearson, EMC, um, of course the HMH, Glencoe, um, Nat Geo, and Cengage. Um, the other thing that Sharon, um, that really stuck out to her was the cultural tours that are involved. And um, I attended the presentations. So what I found was um, that all the, the world language teachers are really interested um, in the culture. That was at the top, they ranked that high in terms of teaching the language, that the culture was so important. And so in the H, H um, I, I say HMH, because it's Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, her, she felt that the cultural tours were the best. They do use Google. Of course, we have our Chromebooks. Um, and so they use a Google tour product in their, um, in their textbook um, online part. The other thing that she um, really liked about the product was the, the ease of the online platform. She felt that she could jump in there and use it, um, and, and it'd be, it would be pretty seamless. So, so that Do you have any questions about French? No, but I'm just going to go on the record that Miss um, Yao was my French teacher when I went to Carson High, back when she was Miss Loudon. So I just think that's kind of cool. Yes. <laughs> she was mine, too, if it was Miss Loudon. <laughs> She's been teaching a long time. Yes, she has. All right. Well, we'll, we'll move on to Spanish then. Is I'd like to acknowledge... Good, uh, oh, what have we been using for a curriculum up to this point? Well, the, uh, the previous adoption is about... I, I looked at the records tonight, 16 years old. So probably whatever's been left mm -hmm. in the classroom. And then uh, I'm sure the teachers, just like with Spanish, they can talk about that too. Just the resources that have been online and resources that they can find. So that's, that's, this is a, a, a timely like adoption. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they had their learning targets, and they pulled their learning targets yeah. from their old materials and then added and, and tried to enrich it on their own. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's been a struggle, um, so they're they were very excited for their turn in this adoption process. So, okay. 
Any All right. Any questions for French? So I guess I just... Mrs. Kima, is this the last round of curriculum updates for the year, or is there another is there another one in the hopper here for the next couple of meetings? So we have um, American Sign Language will complete the world language cycle, and then that will complete ELA for K twelve, and then uh, the uh, what's really left is social studies. We did economics and government for our economics for the high school because of the new class that we're required to teach. Um, but then social studies K-12 is left. And then we're really, we've really re-outfitted all the materials for the teachers. So is that something that will be during this year or next year for the? What we're going to do with that is get that ready and we'll just, you know, we've got to watch what's happening with the budgets. We just have to just watch. All right. Okay, let's talk about Spanish. I'd like to acknowledge the selection uh, committee for the middle school and high school Spanish. Thank you goes to our Carson High Spanish teachers, um, Marissa Morrow, J.P. Alberts, and in the audience is Cadence Reed. She's here with us tonight. Representing middle school is from Carson Middle is Janelle Coffer, who is sitting with us again tonight, and Mr. Thomas Chandler, who will be teaching Spanish next year at Eagle Valley. Again, we had Cheryl Macy, Mrs. Cheryl Macy, look at the materials as uh, a school employee, but also as a parent. And then in this case, our non-school parent, her name is Rachel, uh, and I should have checked with somebody about that name, Bre Breadhop? Breadhop. Yes, she knows, yes. Thank you very much. So we want to make sure we've got that down for the record and I have a correct spelling. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the committee, I'm going to leave my chair, kind of sit in the back so that they have room at the table to talk about why they selected um, Senderos, a series published by Jose Blanco for 6 through 12 Spanish. And you've got teacher editions and students editions up there for you to look at. So I thought we would start uh, with middle school. Um, Janelle Coffer yeah. teaches at Carson Middle School, and um, I thought we would start there and just ha have them talk about the progression because we have 1A, 1B, all the way through, well, we could go all the way up to um, Spanish 5 if we decide to add that, but right now we're looking, yeah, through Spanish 4. So um, I'll turn it over to Janelle. Yeah, hi, I'm Janelle Coffer. I teach Spanish Carson Middle School, like she said. Um, I'm pretty new, and when I was given like the job they didn't have they had a textbook but it was so old I didn't have a teacher's textbook for a long time so I had to build my own curriculum and the cool thing is my principals let us now we're going to start doing Spanish they have to start in seventh grade so instead of just doing Spanish one in one year they're going to have it separated into two years and so the kids are going to have a lot more exposure to the language they're going to be able to do a lot more culture and we can go a lot more in depth of the concepts that are super hard in spanish one so hopefully the idea is that those kids go up to carson high school up to spanish two and just do amazing that's my plan and so the biggest thing i think i saw with this vistas is that this publisher only does languages they don't focus on any other type of um, curriculum and so there's a lot of support they have um, people working in all 21 spanish-speaking countries so you have authentic text you have authentic um, spanish speakers they have this amazing online um, curriculum which supports our one-to-one -one, where the kids can practice speaking to somebody in colombia or venezuela they can listen to different accents from different countries they can practice all this writing they can practice like so many things and it has you know this progression and it allows them to retake and so for me seeing the scope and sequence and seeing how it just kind of spirals and it will help us into high school i really thought that this was a better program than the other books that we looked at and now i'll turn it over to thomas chandler who will be the spanish um teacher over at eagle valley next year uh, good evening i'm thomas chandler as she said um for Vista, I think, like everything that Janelle said, I would certainly echo. And this being my fifth textbook adoption in the last three years, I've kind of started to develop a 
little bit, <laughs> little bit of understanding as far as looking at the presentations that the that these salespeople bring. And I would say that one of the things that I've seen with Vista is that. I really appreciated what the customer service they were bringing even up front. Uh, Perla, the lady that came from Vista, um, was just a very fabulous presenter, not just, and not just presenter. She was already trying to work with us, presenting, giving us material access to things. Um, you know, kind of a, you're always kind of wondering, well, if, we, if we adopt your material, are you going to be there for us? And... Perla has already made it clear to us that, you know, she's there to support us, is already sharing materials on Google Drive with us, and really kind of looking forward to coming back and kind of easing the transition for us as much as she possibly can. So that was just a really big uh, selling point for me. Uh, but, you know, looking at it for, for me transitioning from ESL into Spanish, um, I'm looking forward to just the material, like, like uh, we talked about earlier, the the strong emphasis upon culture is also just a really big part of what Vista brings to the table that I'm just really excited to, to be able to teach next year. Questions for middle school? Okay, and this is Cadence Reed, and she's new to Carson High this year, and um, we're ex very excited to have her. So, Caden? Is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I teach at Carson High School, um, and I was really impressed with um, Vista. We looked at a number of different textbooks, um, and once we had the presentation from Vista, it was very clear that they had the best quality product and the best resources for us. Um, their digital resources are super um, extensive and very modernized. I mean, they align with so many different best practices. And as Thomas said, our presenter parallel was phenomenal. She's a teacher herself. So it was more than just a product presentation. It was it was like a professional development. So and she's very eager to come back and work with us. Um, and the types of materials that she's sharing with us is, um, for example, we have access. This was a huge selling point for all of us. We have access to a Google Drive with um, a collaboration of all these different customized teacher materials from all the different teachers who use this product all over the country. So it's it's kind of like a teacher's pay teachers just for this company that we have access to. Um, and she has offered to come back and work with us, and we all really liked her. So that was huge. Um, also, their online assessments um, are very modern. They they auto grade themselves and the students get um, instant you know, feedback on their performance, which I thought was amazing. And there's so many ways for them to interact like um, Janelle was mentioning. So overall, the product just really stood out as um, exceptional to us. And we all agreed unanimously <laughs> pretty much right away that it was what we wanted to get. So. And I just wanted to dovetail with what Cadence had said there as far as we, I think we all agreed that uh, the online portion of the VISTA just would really do a fabulous job of supporting the district initiatives as far as our one-to-one -one devices that, I mean, it just gave us opportunities for flipping the classroom as far as the videos that kids can watch at home to support, reteach, you know, for any kind of uh, learning that we need to do there. And like I say, technology can be, you know, a constantly used, you know, a constantly used tool there in the classroom. And so it's really going to support that initiative as well. And we did use, sorry, we, we did use one of like the, like I tried um, two of our companies with my seventh graders and I was like, okay, we're, we're looking at this. And they, I was showing them like the benefits of each page and they were very excited about this Vista one. They were very, they're very happy with it. Any questions? No? Uh, I do. Are there consumables th that are required? Not required. So that is something that we can consider. Um, so for ELA, um, I can just tell you that you know consumables were available, and um, they chose not to use them because everything can be printed out online. And we asked Perla, is that the case? Um, and everything, you know, if so, basically, um, the product actually, I, I looked um, at it, and it 
It comes with the consumables and a notebook for the teachers. So they can just make copies there too. So they, they get that up front. They don't even have to print them out, but they can print th them out. So we'll talk about that as a, as a committee when, when it comes to ordering time and, and just um, some of the, the drawbacks in consumables um, that we've seen, uh, for example, when kids lose them um, and if there's extras and so, and, and is it needed? Is it really necessary or can we, we are a one-to-one -one district, you know, can, can we have some things that we hold and can we have some things that are online? This is probably for Mrs. Kima. Uh, you said this was budgeted. Is this part of that million dollars that the board had previously approved? And what is the cost, I guess, for the two programs? So, Susan Kima, for the record. So, what's different about tonight's presentation is that um, when we bring back the American Sign Language, then I'll have your the cost for you at this point. The timing of this board meeting and uh, being able to do work start with the negotiations, we just got the, we've just got finished with the, the selection. So we wanted to get that before the board. And is that part of the uh, budgeted amount amounts that you had given us? It is part of that, um, but there probably will need to be some budget adjustments from my account. Thank you. So, so basically, you brought it to us so that we could approve the book so they could be approved by the state board yes. at their next meeting. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and participation. And Mr. Chandler, we appreciate you being a veteran. It's always good. I've, I was on one, and you kind of get lost, and you can't get your feet. But to have three and then have the participation that you had, that's I feel very uh, good about the feedback that's come back. So thank you all for your time. Appreciate it. I move that the Carson City School District Board of Trustees approve the recommended 2019 adoption of 6 through 12 world language arts materials, French and Spanish, as proposed by the committee for the Carson City School District as budgeted as presented this evening. I'll second it. Motion by Laurel, second by Richard. Any discussion from the board? So, yeah. Well, go, ahead. go ahead. I think we go have ahead, some Mike. Questions. So, Mrs. Kima, I just have a question. So, when you're saying that there's adjustments, what does that look like? And so I'm just saying, because we're going into this discussion with our budget, and so I kind of want a better sense before I vote on it. I mean, I'm supportive. I know these teachers need the materials, obviously, but I also want to be conscious of the fiscal impacts also. Uh, Susan Kima, for the record. So as you know, I brought a rather large um, K-5 English language arts adoption before you. We also brought a um, 6 through 12 English learner adoption before you. And what, what's happened with the K-5 adoption is the, the company, Hoot Mifflin, has reduced the price for me. So they are for, for me, for the district. And so right now, we're, I've got their new pricing, but I think we could do better. So... This week, we have some more conference calls on that other piece to see if I can keep reducing the cost and see what the savings are for that. Also, for the EL adoption, we are able to not use the budgeted amount that you had given us, but to put that in a grant. So we don't need to use the money that the board set aside for adoptions for us. So while that's all filtering in, then what we'll do is we'll get the committee together. I need to see how much they need, and then I'll be able to give you a final number when we have the ASL presentation before the board. So that's how that's still shifting. Did that answer oh, your and, question, Joe? Oh, go. And I appreciate you kind of negotiating and trying to get us the biggest bang for our buck, really. Well, when you have this kind of an outlay, um, just because we're not the size of Clark doesn't mean we can't get a good deal for our teachers and our students and, and to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. Any other questions? Seeing none, is there any public comment on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you again for your time, and we'll look forward to the next round.
Moving on to number eight, discussion and proposed changes to CCSD policy 510, health examinations. First reading for discussion only, Mrs. Kima. Susan Kima for the record. Content in policy 510 health examinations has not been revised since 1996. This policy was sent to the athletic director, Blair Roman, Carson High School Dean, Mr. Mark Redina, and head, district head nurse, Sheila Story, for their review. Along with their changes and support from Mr. Pavlakis, um, they dis we decided to modernize the language and also to section it off. It was kind of one document, and really it was talking about um, health exams, also sports physicals. So it was really kind of two topics. Since you received your board packet, um, there has been some more discussion on this particular item. I want to thank um, Mrs. Uh, Crossman for bringing it to our attention. Um, there's, there's some items that uh, Renee was able to, uh, Mr. Pavlakis was able to look at the um, document and Renee was able to make new copies for you. So those items that Mrs. Crossman su suggested, as well as after Mr. Roman uh, received the packet, he also let me know that there was another, a couple changes as well. So what, what you're looking at with the red is there's some differences in word choices. In the old document, it talked about vision problems hearing problems. So we're choosing a better word, better word choice by making, choosing instead of the word problem, calling it conditions. Um, the, second, the second change in red is that the first title was for physicals. Those are like the screenings that the nurses conduct um, in the grade school, in the middle school, in the high school. The second portion was for sports physical. So we are making the title sports physical, so it's very clear. And then the third change um, that uh, Mr. Blair, uh, Mr. Roman, as well as Mrs. Crossman brought to my attention, which that I should have caught, is that the NIAA, the Nevada Interscholastic um, Athletic Association, requires a physical the first time that you go out for a sport and then every two years after that. So we wanted to make sure that that was clear in the packet. So those were the changes that you see in red along with the changes suggested um, by Mr. Pavlakis. And then I guess I should say we have one more suggestion. Mr. Walker brought it to my attention this evening before the board meeting that if you look on section A on the first page under physical examination of students and you go down from the first paragraph and you're in that second paragraph where it says vision and hearing screening will also include special education students, a child repeating a grade, and any child who failed an exam during the previous school year. We want to make sure that we're not mixing academics. So what we're going to, uh, the suggestion um, from Mr. Walker was to have it read, a child repeating a grade any child who failed a health exam during the previous school year. Could you say health examination? Sure. Like they're taking health class. I don't know. Sure. We tossed around the word screening, but we didn't want the word screening twice in one sentence. Just a couple other things that I noticed when I read through it. In the first paragraph under physical examinations. The second sentence is, is kind of long, and I had to read it a few times. And I think if we can move that at each, in this, in, when you get through it, it talks about um, the school nurse or, or any other duly qualified person, what they're, they're going to do, but then we have at each school in between. So I think if we, if we move that at each school before the school nurse, so it would be in compliance at each school, the school nurse or the other duly qualified person shall conduct an examination. I think that helps it read a little bit better. What do you think? Or do you think it's no. it's still big and long? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think that, that not to get picky, that, that interim comma there, I don't even know if you need it. You know, it's a school nurse, the school nurse or somebody else. It almost, we're almost chopping up the sentence too much. 
But my bigger question on that one was it talks about you have that sentence and it says the following examinations and then you have A and B. And B says for scoliosis, but it, it's talking more about, it's not really talking about examinations if I'm reading it. I mean, I guess it is. It's just the whole thing's, it's, I, I had to read it like three, four times and I'm still not sure I'm there. So to simplify just yeah. that, see if you can, that yeah. flow into See that. if you can make it flow better and it just seems like it could be simplified. So the, the visual and auditory um, conditions, when I talked to Sheila's story this evening, she said that the, um, the completion of the first year of initial enrollment in elementary school, she said that they don't, they don't examine kindergarten students yet because their, their hearing and their vision isn't fully developed. So they start their examinations in first grade. And then the schools have choices, whether it's third or fourth grade, usually in the elementary in sixth grade in the middle school, and then ninth grade at the high school. Just a thought with vision, just because I know the earlier you catch vision problems, the, the better it is. Can a teacher ref, refer a student? Like if, particularly with amblyopia, what's commonly known as lazy eye, you only have a short window of opportunity in order to, to have treatment be effective before the children get too old. And the earlier you start, the better. So if a teacher notices any kind of, of symptom like that, they can they can recommend screening? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, parents do come in, too, saying, you know, I, I noticed this at home. Do you notice this at school? And they talk to the nurse. So even parents can um, request from the school nurse, you know, some support and guidance. Okay, and then I just have another follow-up question. For the last, on the last, the second page, the last sentence... Um, if all students are required to submit to a physical before they compete in a sanctioned sport, why would we single out any student who is ill or infected with a communicable disease? It seems like all students need to have a physical. So I'm just wondering if that last sentence is really necessary since anyone who's playing a sport is going to have a physical first. Or, or is there a different, is, does NIA a have a different requirement for for those particular types of students do they need to see it an annually or something i'm not sure when when i was reading that what i was kind of wondering is maybe you know you do the sports physical before the event but if somebody had some infection or something to be cleared to go back out and play maybe that's what it's talking about i mean that in my mind that's kind of how i figured it out Makes sense. Yeah, because you only have that physical every two years. So what if they came down with mono or something? Mm -hmm. You'd have to make sure that they're examined before they're cleared to play sport. But I can check and see what the NIAA says too. Well, we can check into that. We can check the law and we can check um, the points that you're making are valid because you will have that initial um, physical. And if you look in Section A, there's a variety of type of uh, medical professionals that can provide a chiropractor. There's a variety of medical professionals that can provide that initial um, uh, exam. Um, and if a student has something more, let's say, let's say um, they've been um, deemed to have high blood pressure then you need somebody of a different level to be looking at that child to make sure that that's safe for them to be on the field. So I do have a question. On page number two, um, let's see, four sentence from the bottom, uh, where it says, school authorities shall notify parents or guardians before performing the required examinations. Are these notifications sent to the homes in English and Spanish if the families are Spanish speakers? Yes. Thank you. It is in the sports physicals, but it's also in the, the, school, um, the school screenings, both English and Spanish. Thank you. Any other suggestions, comments? Seeing none, thank you both for your review of this policy. We appreciate it. We'll see it in the next reading with those corrections. There you go. Thank you. Moving on to number nine, discussion on proposed changes to CCSD policy 546, cell phone usage. First re reading, Mrs. Kima. Policy 546, uh, Susan Kima for the record. 
Policy 546 cell phone usage was reviewed by the Carson City School District's Discipline Committee, whose members comprise of K-12 assistant principals and deans. And we have in the audience um, two of the committee members, Sharon Hallinan, who's a dean at Carson High School, and Mike Paul, who is an assistant principal in the elementary school. This policy was brought to our attention first from uh, Mrs. Cortez because there's a reference to a regulation that was outdated at the bottom of the um, policy. And then as we looked further, we realized that the last time it was updated officially with the language was in 2003. And I would guess that for the most part, we, didn't, we don't have the same deans and vice principals in the, their seat. So it's always good to take these policies and then see what people are actually doing out there to make sure that our policies and our practices are matching. So it was great discussion and um, they updated the policy to make sure that the language was clear as to the classroom expectations as well as expectations for assessment. I guess I just have a question and Stacy kind of leaned over and asked the same thing. Um, the first sentence, so the possession of, by students of pagers, cellular telephones, <coughs> and other similar electronic devices. I think we could take out pagers at this point and just say the possession of cellular <laughs> telephones and other electronic devices. So so I, I have an answer to that. Our, I will tell you our committee did take that out. And I'm assuming that that was back in there because the law... 392.4637 says pagers. Otherwise, Mr. Pavlakis wouldn't have put that back in there. Yes, yes. I double checked that that's that's in there. But the committee that was one of the, you know, one of the first things they, they took out. And I thought to myself, when they see this now and they see it's back in there, I needed to make sure there's an explanation for you, but also for them. Otherwise, they thought that I'm stuck in the past. You know, I'll just say, I like that we've kind of loosened up a little bit. I mean, this was a real time killer for me when I was at the middle school. You know, nowadays people are buying cell phones for their first and second graders. It's a battle that administrators really can't fight. And so I think that, sure, we have to be strict about, you know, standardized testing situations and those types of situations. But at the same time, we don't want to spend all of our time fighting something that society is is providing for their kids really so I, I i liked it thank you any other questions i guess i guess my only question is why the difference between at the high school level that they should be turned off or muted and out of sight and then at the middle and elementary they, they shall be turned off and out of sight it seems like they could be or muted as well or is there a difference do the elementary kids not know how to have it stop vibrating? What? This is why we have some of the committee members here because of all the discussions that might have been around this that I might have missed a piece. I, I, I was thinking there was a reason. I just didn't come up with why. Yeah. For the record, this is Mike Paul. So the discussion for the elementary schools was, and I could just say this from experience. The other day on the playground, we had a little girl that got in trouble, had to go stand on the red dot because she got in trouble. And she um, quickly on her eye watch called her mother and told her that she was being picked on by the teachers. And then the parent came and picked her up from school. And so we just want all the communications with the parents from the kids at that point to come through the office. And that we, you know, that was not a reasonable reason for her to call her parents. If she would have had asked permission, we would not have given her permission to call her parents at that point. So it's just for consistency with the, with um, communication from the teachers and from the administration. Sharon Hallinan, Dean of Students at Carson High School for the record. This past year, Carson High School has adopted a new electronics policy, not just a cell phone policy, to address the myriad of personal electronic devices that students have in their possession. And we have really tried to focus on safety and learning. Safety is the earbuds part where they have it on, they're crossing the street, can't hear, 
or they're um, walking in, into a, a spill and they can't hear us saying, stop, don't go that way, um, because they can't hear us when they have their music blaring in their earbuds or their headphones. Um, the learning part of it is students were having their Bluetooth earbuds in and their phone on during class time. And so by having cell phones and earbuds not present in the classroom, we're redirecting students to focus on learning. Now, of course, teachers can direct students to use it for academic reasons, right? If they want to get out their phone to use it as a calculator with teacher permission, they can do that. If they need headphones, they're provided if it's for an academic reason in the classroom. So we're really just shifting at the high school, focusing more on safety and learning. And we don't ban it during lunch and passing period. You know, they still have those um, devices accessible to them. I think there's also some pieces of, of responsibility when the little ones are in the elementary are bringing an expensive cell phone and another person doesn't have that and, and, and how, knowing when to use it and not use it versus um, that gradual release of responsibility to those students that are in the high school. And I would also think about a lot of our teenagers have jobs. And in today's world, some of those, those kids and their families really rely on those jobs for the livelihood of their families. And so that also would require them to have those devices at times. And so, I mean, I think that that's, that's something we have to think about. Those, those kids have to work to stay in school and stay in their homes. We have to support that as much as we can. And it looked like all of them survived the unplugged week, too, at Carson High. Because so. <laughs> I thought this was timely because, right. <laughs> because we just had that. So that doesn't mean you can't do other things. Richard? Absolutely. Yeah. I was able to review a couple other model policies. And one thing that was in a couple of them was that they restricted the use of a cellular phone or other recording device in locker rooms, restrooms. And I wonder if there's any thought given to that for obvious reasons. And then the other thing that was in a, a few of them was that a disclaimer that the district was not responsible for any lost or broken cell phones or recording devices, et cetera. And I don't know if uh, there's been any thought given to those two areas. It's not part of our policy, but we always tell the kids that if they have those devices, that that either they need to stay in their backpacks or we give the kids the option of putting it on the teacher's desk or in a teacher, one of the desk drawers so that it's locked up and supervised, especially, you know, during lunches if the teachers don't lock their rooms and, and kids know they're there. That is always a concern. And I know we have several kids that um, just hand their phone to their teachers in the morning and they lock it in their desk and then they get it right before they go home at night. And that... So that is a concern that we have addressed. We have had kids have stolen phones. And, you know, we talk to them about that's part of your responsibility to make sure that it's put away and it's not sitting out where it's accessible to lots of people. So that is something that we have talked about with our kids. That's probably a good thing to add, Richard. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think it would be a good thing to add. But what about the use of a... Uh cell phone uh, that's capable of recording in the locker rooms or restrooms? I, I think for safety reasons, I think that might be, I don't know, did the committee discuss that all, at all, or do you think that's something I think we should probably take a look at to add? So Sharon Hannan, for the record, um, the RPE teachers prohibit cell phones being out in the locker room and prohibit, of course, any recording in the bathroom, and that is NRS. That is a state law that you cannot record uh, students' body parts that are naked, um, and that would apply to the locker room, bathrooms, uh, et cetera. So we would enforce, of course, state law. So it wouldn't be bad to probably put in the policy then. Good point. And I'm just thinking the, pub, the, the community pool has just a sign notice that cell phone use is prohibited in the, in the restroom, locker room. That's not... And not just when they're in PE, but I think it, it would apply to any middle school, high school bathrooms situation. 
I think it should be elementary school too, because we, I mean, just for safety reasons, we do have parents that come and have lunch with their, with students. I just think that if we're going, going to put it in policy, we need to put it for elementary school also. Yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah, and I'm sure that the computer teachers are already teaching the kids about digital citizenship and that they're extending it to this as well. But Great feedback. Any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for all your Thank work. Thank you for the Appreciate additional it. suggestions. We'll look forward to getting that back for a second reading. Moving on to number just, 10. Uh, if I could, just so you know, I have some uh, draft language. If you want it, I'll give it to you for the... Could we have uh, you submit that to Renee? Sure. Thank you. Moving on to number 10, presentation and discussion of tentative budget scenarios and assumptions for the Carson City School District for the fiscal year 2019-2020 for discussion only. Mr. Fueling, I just want to remind everybody there are still a lot of unknowns. There's no reason to panic yet. And that we are having this discussion because we are responsible trustees and trying to look at a lot of scenarios in case something happens. But I don't want this to cause a chaos throughout the community. We are just looking at it, but we have a lot of unknowns still. So, Mr. Fueling, from there, it's all yours. Thank you, President Wilkie. Uh, Andrew Fueling, for the record. <clears throat> so... Tonight is, uh, uh, I think, the fifth in a series of updates on uh, the budget as we've been progressing through the year. Um, still learning information, uh, still wanting to know much, much more than we do. Um, however, with the legislative session, uh, it's not as forthcoming as, as we would like. So we carry on. Um, something that I put together, and I, I hope I, I didn't, uh, I know I tend to strain your eyes with some of these numbers sometimes, but um, in the district finance officers across the state have been spending a lot of time um, communicating and trying to make heads or tails of what's happening with this new funding model, what's <laughs> happening with the old funding model, which we apparently are still going to use um, for this biennium and the, the impacts. And so one of my predecessors, and, and I, I don't know who for sure, but I, I would guess it's my predecessor's predecessor, uh, Bob Anderson, he, he had a lot of great old spreadsheets with amazing old financial information that I and one of the few people that probably find really interesting. Um, but it, it was really an eye-opener. I ended up, I, I don't know that anyone else has this information in the state. Um, it's hard to find uh, anything more than 10 years old, really, for the, for the most part. Um, but he had every single uh, per people amount, the, the statewide average, and for Carson City, going back to 1971. So 1971 is the first year that the Nevada plan actually took effect. It was instituted in 60, or approved, I think, in 67 and instituted to start in, uh, in 71. And so I, I ended up sharing this with my uh, friends across the state. And it was a real eye-opener. And I think just kind of sets the stage for the rest of the, this discussion that we're having tonight. So starting in 71, your statewide average per people was $577. And I'll, I'll try to point around the screen to lead your eyes to places because it, of course, doesn't show up on the screen. Um, and then two columns over from that, it shows you the percentage change going to the next year. Um, and then highlighted in yellow then, a little ways down shows you what the compounded annual growth was. So it basically, it's kind of like an average, but not exactly. But if you had um, to get from $577 per pupil to $1,252 per pupil in 1980, 10 years later, what would that rate 
of increase have to be each year on average to get there. So from 1970 to 1980, you had about a 9% increase each year, which is huge. Um, you go into the next decade, the 1980s, and you're right in line there as well at almost 9%, 8.8%. What, what I find really interesting about this is if you were living in this area or California back in that time period of like 1979, 1980, you had this whole thing going on called the Taxpayers' Revolt. And what you'd see, I show this graph during our budget hearing where you, you see the, the tax rate um, that the school district was collecting and then you get to 1979 and it collapses because of what politically was going on during that time. And it... it I think it was actually cut almost in like 25% of what it had been. It was really, really significant. But you look at those numbers in 1979, 1980, 1981, 1982, and you still see these large increases. <laughs> so what that means in my world is that since the tax rates had dropped so much, the state had to kick in themselves so much more to keep making those rates go up. Because if your your local dollars go down, your state dollars have to go up. And it, it's just amazing to me that the, there was that much effort coming from the state side to keep things going for education. So you go on to your next decades. And you'll notice through the 1990s, you're at about 2.7%. So it's, it's a pretty significant change. Um, in the rate of increase um, for education. And then you get into the 2000s and it's 3.3. .3, so it seems to be trending back up. And then you get to the 2010s and you're at about 1.4% per year. And you can see those percentage increases year to year. Just You don't see anything like you had seen in the prior four decades. Um, and when you talk about uh, a business where you're primarily service-based, um, and so you have 80 to 85% of your costs usually are staffing. Um, those, those, that eats up a lot of that, those small percentage increases that you get over time. And generally, it, it doesn't seem to, to quite cover it. So um, while in the first two decades, the 70s and 80s, if you went through, through your school board training, you might have um, met a counterpart of mine, uh, a friend of mine from White Pine County, Paul Johnson or uh, Jeff Zander, former superintendent from Elko, and they kind of give you the history of the Nevada plan and probably put you in tears because it's so exciting. Um, but they'll talk about how back in, in the 70s and, and 80s, that time frame, Nevada was one of the best funded states for education and, and very well performing at the same time. Um, that clearly is not uh, seemingly continuing uh, on the funding side. Uh, going forward. Okay, so uh, some of this is similar to last time. But I don't have everything from the last time. Um, but again, we, we are, it, it appears that we're going to be funded based on the old model at this point. Um, and we, last time we met, we're encouraged to use the current years per pupil amount. And we have updated information on that that I'll share. Um, they are going to run a new model once they figure out what it looks like, and um, that is still a huge point of contention for a lot of us because we don't know what it looks like yet, just to see what how it um, compares to the old model for each district. And there is an intent not to have districts harmed, um, but that is still unknown as to what that looks like. Um, continuing to work, the as I said, the district finance officers are in communication fairly regularly um, and everyone's kind of gathering pieces as they get them and finding new things to talk about. Um, one of the more recent ones is this successful schools per pupil number that has been widely talked about and, and is the number that is being focused on seems to have some flaws in it that, that we're trying to research and better understand, but we still don't quite know how they came up with that number and that's where we're... Um, I say we, we do know and we're learning how they did it and there seems to be some questions with that. So we're, we're working on that. One of the, the larger pieces for us too is that 
this whole move to a new funding model potentially is going to cost additional money. Um, and there still is no information out as far as we know about uh, a funding source to, to help take care of that. So on March 13th, uh, NDE sent out uh, and actually kind of caught us off all, all off guard um, with a the old funding model plugged in with the new governor's budget and it, it's the new corrected model um, and it kicks out all the new numbers for the districts and I'll show you what those are here in just a second. Um, the, the numbers that are shown there uh, were along the lines of what we were thinking that there would be some districts that were severely impacted and about half of them are and Carson City is one of them. Um, we are currently, in, in terms of looking at some of the harm that you'll see, um, some districts, including Carson City, are working to get information to the legislature about the, the intent to have a hold harmless, what is called a phase-in of um, the impact um, over the next couple years. So when the state superintendent, Dr. Canavero, uh, presented the work that we had done over the last four years uh, fixing the current uh, funding model. Um, he presented on June 21st, 2018 to the Interim Committee on uh, Education at the legislature. And in, in both the presentation and what he stated, they talked about doing a phase-in of the impact. So this was not... Um, this is not something kind of out of right field for us to, to ask for, but when ND recently submitted this information, they apparently didn't have anything in there about uh, a type of fate, any type of hold harmless phase in of this impact, which was pretty disturbing considering that's exactly what the state superintendent had recommended just six or seven months earlier. Um, there is precedent for a phase in. Um, type of hold harmless process. So back in uh, 2008, um, there were air, uh, some clean, there was some cleanup of the model and they did a four year phase in of the impact. Um, it gets a little complicated to talk to it, but, but basically just as um, it, you'd feel a little bit of it in the first year, a little bit more in the second year. So it would give districts time to make some adjustments. But by the time four years was up, sometimes the the per people had caught up enough where you really didn't even need the hold harmless and maybe you saw some increase. So these are the numbers that were in the, um, the document, the file that NDE sent to us. So Carson City is highlighted in yellow. In the current year that we are in right now, we're receiving $7,198 per pupil. And if you remember, um, last time we met, the budget that we presented, um, or the assumptions we presented, had about a uh, $4.7 million deficit. And that was based on the assumption that that number, the 7198, would hold into the new year. So, with what NDE sent us, um, and it shows a reduction down to $7,060 per year that would reduce our funding by approximately another $1 million going into the new year. Um, what is also disheartening <coughs> is that when you get into fiscal 21, so two years from now, which is the second column from the right, you'll see that that number is also less than where we are, where we stand in the current year. So, these numbers are not for sure the numbers. The legislature still has to review them. The legislature still has to approve them. We're not there yet. But these are the numbers. If you take what the governor has given in his budget to education, and if you try to calculate things out the way they've always been calculated out up until now, these are the numbers that come out. So there's they're not for sure, but at the same time, there's some weight, I think, to them to, to definitely be considered. You'll notice that Churchill, Douglas, Elko, um, Eureka, Humboldt, Lander, Nye, and Pershing counties all also take losses. Um, 
locally, uh, Churchill and Douglas um, seem to get impacted because I, I've spoken before about how there were er er uh, errors in how charter school students were counted, um, and that now that that has been fixed, it that really helps out Clark. You'll notice Clark gets a lot more money. Um, Washoe gets a lot more money because they had a lot of, the, of uh, they have a lot of charter students in their district. Um, so they really kind of have an oversized gain um, because of that. Um, Elko also has a large uh, charter school population, actually. Um, and with that fix, they also got hurt uh, substantially. So um, in the old model and in the new model, Elko seemed to be really struggling with, um, with numbers. Any, any questions so far on any of this? Um, so again, just kind of as you're thinking through this, uh, I'll, I'll review the timeline for budget where we are currently. Uh, looking at enrollment projections again last time, we showed an, uh, an increase of about 50 students expected for next year. Um, the per pupil amount, that has changed from the last time we met. Um, and again, it's uh, 7,060, but it, that is not a definite, uh, absolutely definite number, but it is... Uh, a pretty reasonable number, I think, is as reasonable as we're going to get to budget off uh, before the legislative session is through. So we have received our final uh, revenue pro uh, projections from the Department of Taxation, um, which generally don't change all that much from their preliminary projections, but they're important. They, they factor in largely into the general fund revenue stream. Um, the next uh, step for us will be at the April 9th meeting, which is the next board meeting where I'll be presenting the tentative budget. You'll have a nice um, 70 plus page document of numbers um, that will be in your packets that will be for discussion and input, but that is not for, the, the it is not, uh, the board does not need to approve that budget. It's not an uh, uh, item for motion. Um, th there, I mean, after what we discussed tonight, I don't think there will be anything that is a surprise to you when we come to that meeting, uh, that next board meeting, that document will represent what we talk about tonight. Um, I turn that into taxation uh, soon thereafter, and then we'll have our, our budget hearing uh, about a month later. So there will still be time to make adjustments if we learn more information, um, hopefully to the, to the good and not to the bad. Um, and then probably after we actually submit the budget to the state will find out how much money we have and the legislature will give us that number. Um, I don't know how, we'll, I don't know that I need to get into this too much, but the, the pr final projections were close to what our initial projections were. Um, I have to do the ad valorem projections myself because we don't get that and it, those came in pretty close to what um, the state has projected for us. So that's that's good. Yeah. Just on one of your slides, you know, you just had a bullet that said intent is not to have districts harmed. Mm -hmm. Yet the table you showed, nine districts are harmed. Mm -hmm. What's what's the conversation been about not harming districts? So um, there's really a, one of the, the great frustrations I think we're all having is that we're, we're living in kind of these two realities of this old model and new model. Um, so the intent not to be harmed that statement is really more about the new model they when they're talking about moving districts into this new model um, the company Augenblick that did the study uh, for the state on funding they said and they do this across the country they said specifically that there has to be some kind of if you want districts and communities to buy into this you you can't have anyone get harmed in the process um, and and so while that seems really apparent and reasonable, there has been, um, other than one of the, the legislators telling us there was no one, there's no intent to harm anybody, we really don't have any more kind of proving it, you know, and so that, that's a concern. Um, at the same time, I think Dr. Canavero's statement, when, when we were talking about the old model and the corrections that were made and now bringing those corrections, um, you know, kind of in, into reality for us, and impacting us, there was from the leadership at NDE also this 
expectation or I, I think intent not to harm on that side as well. Um, and we have an idea of what that would look like. And, and, and one of the things to consider is that if, um, if there would be a hold harmless on the old model, which is which are the numbers we're looking at now, um, and based on the precedent that has happened uh, in prior years when, when they made fixes like this, um, our per pupil amount may very well get much closer back to the 7198 we have this year. There'd likely be only a 10% reduction, which is, um, or I'm sorry, not 10% reduction. Um, we, we would have to absorb 10% of the, the total impact. So here, let me just jump back a minute. So you have a change of $138. So in the in the first year, that change would be only 13, well, basically say $13.80. So instead of having a per pupil amount of 7,060, it may be uh, 71, uh, 83 or 84. Sorry, I'm struggling. I'm trying to do this right now, but. Um, so we, we very well could end up closer back to this number, which would bring us back about a million dollars to the good or say $900,000 to the good is probably the way, a better way to look at it. Um, and, and again, there's precedent for that. There was support from it with the leadership at NDE and what they presented to the legislature, but where that goes, uh, we're just not quite sure. So last time, most of these numbers are from last time. The the ones in the red are new numbers. So um, we, we had our revenue and expenditures laid out for a $4.7 million deficit um, with that per pupil amount reduced to $7,060. That reduces our general fund revenue by an additional million dollars. So then you have a $5.7 million deficit. Um, it really doesn't change what I said last time as far as if you're going to sustain that kind of deficit, you, you really would not be able to do it more than two years before the district's uh, financial health and would be of concern and uh, the state likely would start um, maybe not fully intervening, but start asking questions about um, what's happening in the district. So uh, Trustee Crossman, last time we were here, um, ask for a little bit of a like a projection on where uh, ending fund balance will likely be at the end of this year. And um, at this point in the year, from a uh, staffing cost standpoint, it, it's pretty easy to zero in where you are, except for the impact of grants near the end of the year, where grants are able oftentimes to pick up some staffing costs out of the general fund. Um, and then uh, as far as supply costs, costs some things like utilities and that you can pretty much kind of see where the trend is going but um, a, a lot of times the the supply costs at the end, the end of the year um, are they're a little hard to to nail down um, but I think I think conservatively um, the ending fund balance would be about 13 million dollars so I, I, I really I would expect that number to be a little bit higher um, but as a low-end number I think that 13 million is reasonable and that would put you at about 18, almost 19% um, fund balance. And, and you're looking at the next year's ex, uh, uh, expenditures to uh, base that number off of. So that, that's, a, that, that's a healthy number. If you're at 19%, you're, you're doing well. Um, however, then if you have a $5.7 million deficit in fiscal year 20, you would expect your fund balance to be reduced to 7.3 million, which is 10.5%. So your 10.5% um, really, if you're looking at other districts statewide, is not not necessarily a bad number for that percentage. Um, but at the same time, it's not, it's less than we've been used to for the last number of years. And and just to to take that another step, so if you go another 5.7 million dollar deficit, you're obviously going to be in a much worse situation. So. Um, I, I hope that kind of frames, um, I guess, my, my mindset. And I think it was a, a good question from um, Trustee Crossman to, to lay it out in this fashion. And I just wanted to show you, too, so um, this is, for Carson City School District, a history of what that fund, bal 
fund balance percentage has looked like. And so it, it tells a little bit of a story and, oops, sorry. I don't know um, much of what was going on back during these times, but as you get into 06, 07, 08, the economy was booming and 9, 10, even though the economy had slowed down, the revenues were still coming in pretty well. And, and the plan at this time um, w for the district was knowing that the recession really was already here um, to start banking some of this in reserve to, to be able to ride out the bad times that would lie ahead. And the district took significant um, lumps in general fund per pupil amount going into fiscal 11, fiscal 12, fiscal 13. And so really with um, some, some great planning and um, you know, probably a lot of conversations uh, you know, around the district with all the, all the stakeholders, we're able to, to make that happen and, and ride out those times. Just to add to that, it was a group effort back then. I mean, Mr. Anderson put it together, but it was because of the associations and their seeing the vision of the recession and not wanting to be in positions like Clark and Washoe at the time, that it was it was a community effort and the stakeholders, the teachers, the classified, the administrators, and the board. So it and now we are so blessed that we're not I mean, it's a hit, but we haven't had a hit for many years. We haven't had to cut those people. And it's because of that cooperation with everybody and everybody having the same vision for the kids. And, and I do want to thank the, all of those stakeholders at that time because we could have been using that for other stuff. And the, the teachers could have gotten much better raises and stuff, and they decided not to. They decided to bank it, and, and we're here today with programs and, and staff that we have because of those sacrifices back then so I, I just want to reiterate that it was a, a community effort and I'm glad to see that we're being able to to show that today sure and and to, to <coughs> point out too then you um, you know you you finally in fiscal 14 started to see uh, significant increases in the the DSA per pupil amount again so um, we're able to to build back and in the the last two years that or that percentage is basically stabilized now in the last three years not necessarily trying to grow it anymore but trying to bring back programming and, and bring on some other um, uh, important you know uh, support for the district and for our students um, so that leads us then to the, the last meeting, uh, talked about the bottom line and what the comfort level was. And um, the direction I got as a, as a starting point at least was what would it take to get to, uh, to reduce the deficit so that it wasn't greater than $3 million. And so we, um, as a team, have been discussing this and had been discussing it uh, before then, I mean, for, for quite a while, realizing that there, there could be some concern. So what, what has been laid out is, uh, I'll start with the, the non-staffing costs. So um, first, th the, there was a million dollars uh, budgeted for curriculum in the current year. When you go to the next year, um, even though there, there are still some needs, as, as Mrs. Kima discussed, um, that is one area where you, you could take that out for the year um, and hopefully, um, you know, again, I think with a lot of these things, you're hoping that uh, once the session is over, we'll have a better feel of where we are and, and we'll need to reprioritize um, how we're taking care of some of these things. Um, we have a $500,000 reduction in the technology replacement schedule. Um, Trustee Walker, you brought this up at the last meeting as, as an area maybe to consider, and um, in, in, in Trustee Crossman actually we uh, spoke to it as well, some, some concern on the student side with, with the Chromebooks. So um, where we ended up with that is um, leaving enough money um, in that, re that fund to continue replacing Chromebooks. Um, for students, so those devices are uh, continuing to function for them and can support all these uh, amazing curriculum pieces that those folks here were uh, discussing tonight. But um, at least for next year, there wouldn't be replacement of no funding to replace smart boards, audio enhancement systems, uh, computer labs, or teacher laptops. 
Um, the next piece is a 5% cut to um, school and department budgets. So again, this does not include things like utilities. It does not include things like um, the online education program that comes out of Mrs. Kima's department. Um, it doesn't include gasoline for the buses, things like that. But um, those are things that are maybe more discretionary, that's where you would see that 5% cut, and that represents about $200,000. Each year, the district um, budgets enough to replace one bus, um, and that, that is... Uh, a number one bus is a number that that in doing some analysis and seer who uh, oversees transportation or um well oversees the transportation department um worked out that that that's a good for us one bus a year is a good replacement timeline to to continue um having our fleet um up and running and getting rid of the the buses that do need to be moved on to better places um the current sfa contract would be able to go away is that now that we've adopted all this new um, k5 curriculum that's something we don't need the same support with anymore so that's a hundred thousand dollar savings so for non-staffing costs the total reductions are about 1.9 million dollars for staffing costs so um, currently at the elementary schools, we have um, uh, ELA uh, ISs. Um, and so they are all um, funded 0.75 in the general fund. So um, what is fortunate is that the read by three grant for this next year has been approved to include 100% of their costs in the new year. So those, all those salaries will be moving out of the general fund and into grant funding. So that is a savings to, to the general fund. Um, we currently have two uh, instructional coaches at the middle school level, one at Carson Middle School and one at Eagle Valley Middle School. Um, those positions would move, um, would not be continued next year um, under any funding stream, that's a savings of about two hundred and ten thousand um, dollars. There are two positions that were funded for this year as interventionists, um, kind of a, a remnant of the um, read by grade three fiasco we had at the beginning of this year, um, and we moved those into the general fund. So those positions would not be continued next year uh, at a savings of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. There are also three parapro positions uh, also within that read by three um, uh, kind of fix that the, the board allowed for. That's $85,000 of savings. Um, currently, our work-based learning coordinator, uh, point Dave, three. Just a quick question on the read by grade three paras. Are, are any of those included in the read by three grant, or, or could any of them be moved over to that grant? No. Um, the work-based learning coordinator, so 37% of um, the cost of that position is currently in the general fund. The rest is funded by the work-based learning grant. Next year, um, we were able to get approval to have that funded 100% under the work-based learning grant. So that is a $43,000 savings to the general fund. Um, and then based um, on enrollment, simply based on enrollment and, and uh, projected class sizes, um, there'd be a reduction of uh, one teacher at Mark Twain Elementary and one at Fremont Elementary uh, for a savings of $160,000. And, and with that happening, they would still be well within their uh, class size ratios um, going into the new year. So the total staffing reduction is just over $1 million. So with the teachers at those two schools, aren't those the two schools that we're adding classrooms to, though, with the construction? They are, uh, yeah, they are. So um, Mark Twain, remember, they're going to be uh, replacing basically six classrooms. They, they have all the portables outside, so they'll be, they'll be moving in the building. Um, 
and and yeah, that that's kind of the the, the biggest one. But yeah, we're, we're adding space, but but really, in in Fremont of any elementary school has the probably the most compact, um, intense space utilization. They they really. Um, they they could already use more space. So even with a reduction of a teacher, they will still fill their their new building for sure. So if you, Mr. Fueling, if oh, I could yeah. add, and the reason for Mark Twain's uh, facilities being pretty much packed is because we're moving CLS from Seeliger as well. Oh, you, I, I am very sorry. I actually I have the wrong school up there. It's Empire in Fremont. It is not Mark Twain. You're, you're right, Jose. But I, I'm, I'm very sorry. I, I screwed that up. Um, it's Empire Elementary. If, if you remember when we um, reviewed the um, the staffing, uh, not staffing, the enrollment projections going forward, um, at, uh, I think three or four meetings ago, um, Empire Elementary's enrollment numbers have been dropping steadily over the years, and that's where um, the ability to re reduce one teacher. Um, kind of feeds into that from just the, the fewer and fewer students being there. Um, so in total then between the non-staffing and staffing reductions, you have about 3 million um, in uh, cuts uh, across the district. So from a $5.7 million projected deficit um, if there were no reductions, you're down to about a $2.7 million deficit um, with, with those reductions. And that's, that's what I have. So are there, I guess, any questions, thoughts? I can go back to any slide you're interested in looking at. Any questions? And, and so ju just, I guess, for, for understanding purposes, when... Um, coming into the next meeting, again, it's tentative budget. It's not. It's not for approval. But um, if, if this if this was where you were comfortable, you know, g given the situation, given the uncertainty that this is a starting point, the the budget I would bring for the tentative budget would be uh, would have this two point seven million dollar deficit as as basically a bottom line item. The the only adjustment to that is. Um, we always add in that contingency line item as your just in case access, so that that number historic. Well, since I've been here, I've always used a million dollars. There isn't necessarily a rhyme or reason to that, except that it can't be more than one point five million. There's like a percentage cap, and it, it always works out to about one point five million. Um, but it gives some significant flexibility to the board if it, it felt the need to use it. Um, there are also some carry forward amounts that that come forward, um, but again, those those are not always used all at once. So there might be a little bit used here and there, but um, some of those amounts from the, the schools and departments are always included. But if you want a, a baseline understanding of kind of the you know the the operating deficit, it's, it's that two point seven million dollar number that that would be, Mr. Walker. AJ, you know, in the governor's budget, he talks about the, I think it was a 3% raise for all teachers that he really wants to earmark and make sure it goes towards salary. So something like that could also impact our bottom line if they don't make adjustments. So in, on top of what they're going to give us, so if they take what they're going to give us and then say, oh, by the way, included in that, you need to make 3% salary. So I mean... Has there any be, been any discussion about that? And if there hasn't been, that's fine. I'm just sure. wondering if that's no, it's, one it's of the a, considerations. It's a good question. So um, I guess it, I, I, if you remember the last meeting, there was this chart looking at. So if you take this year's number, uh, uh, per pupil number statewide, and you add in the cost of, the, the, of uh, everyone getting their steps, which the state always thinks is 2%, and then you add in a 3% increase on top of that, and then you add in the increase for health insurance, you, you come to a number that is well higher than what the governor is saying it costs in his budget. So that, that clearly is a problem that we have not figured out an answer to yet. Um, 
so in the in the new year, so we we have a, a four year agreement with um, all of our associations. There's a there's a two percent increase for next year already there. Um, as far as what three percent might look like, and and really to think about too. So within the governor's budget, it's a three percent and a zero, and that that second year zero is not. Uh, is widely discussed. I think the three percent caught much more attention. Um, so when you think about kind of in the larger scheme of things, our, our budget may really kind of reflect that already. Um, but at the same time, we we haven't delved too deep into that conversation. Um, but it it certainly is a, a concern with the perception of what people should be seeing in the, in the government or the governor. Um, you know, kind of I think. That, that has been widely publicized as a part of his budget. So um, I think there's definitely more to, to be discussed with that, but, but haven't gotten too far into the impact within this. Trustees, if I may, um, Jose Delphin, for the record, there's also PERS increases that have happened. So um, Mr. Fueling, I think that was 1.25% mm -hmm. from PERS. Correct. So along with that, the governor has not factored in of those ancillary benefits. Um, it's more than 3% when we do it, folks, just for the record. And I was also just going to point out there's a, there's a bill, AB 277, that would require, that it's proposed to require school boards to um, negotiate a 3% increase for, for in salaries for teachers every year and to re to open up negotiations, but there's no funding included at all with that bill. Um, so I, I I don't know where they keep thinking they're going to get the money from, but um, that would that would be one to watch as well. Um, if you're looking at, I was trying to pull it up to find the the language of it, but I couldn't find that. Um, just another question for you, though, AJ, on the um, reductions and and everything that we've got there. I know back in I remember back in like 2013 when we were doing it, we um, had to make budget cuts and we um, offered incentives to retirees because there were significant savings when re when um, staff at the higher end of the scale retired. And, and then it was cheaper. Have you estimated that in the budget, or is that an additional area that could be reduced? That is not in here. So that that would be an additional area that we could consider. I I think um, I feel like the times when that happened were quite different from where we are now. So the 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 impact you'd see so so at that time the school district's enrollment was actually I still I still think falling at that point and so if you think of it in terms of you're um, trying to incentivize people to step away and retire um, and maybe not filling those positions at that point maybe you could absorb that where where we would struggle now is is twofold I think where not only do we have increasing enrollments. Um, you also so we have more positions to fill effectively, um, but then you also have the issue of vacancies. And so, if you're creating vacancies and we're having a hard time, you know, I'm, I'm not kidding you that every day I I get these uh, updates from my National School Business Association, and every day there's one article about one state where they're really concerned because there appears to be a critical labor shortage in the teacher market and nobody knows what to do about it and it, it it's just everywhere so so i think those two things um make it so that might might not be where we want to go what it would do i mean if you did do that depending on the i, I think we were somewhat strategic as to what positions it was offered for but if it was offered for teaching positions i would be concerned because uh, I, I think the kind of unintended consequence is uh, if you're having a hard time hiring folks, is it may end up driving up class sizes to, because you're not able to find these other people or just more long-term subs. But, yeah. And, and didn't you find last year that with, with the people retiring and the people that we hired, we didn't have any savings like we usually do because the people coming in were more highly skilled and more had more experience behind them? Right, yeah. Th they're... Um, I think there ended up being a, a little bit of savings, but it wasn't 
nearly what I expected. It, like what, what we had seen historically, it, it wasn't anywhere near that number. So, and that's something I, I have some of that built into this, but I've really toned back the kind of the expectation for the savings that would come from um, replacement of retiring or resigning staff. Sorry to keep jumping in here, Jose Delphin again for the record. Uh, we also took away just the limited five years of experience and we're taking all years of experience in Nevada. So that's also, it's helping me with recruitment, but it's not helping with the budget. Richard? If we would go with the $2.7 million deficit, what would the deficit be next year? Because I know the cost inflates, so it's going to be greater. How much greater would it be next year? Right, so um, you're going to end up, we, we would probably generate about another million dollars in revenue. So it would bring it up to, and, and, and as I say this, uh, Trustee Varner, I, I really like to be able to come back to you with more definite numbers, but I, I would expect maybe another million in revenue. Um, but then you're also probably going to have another additional $2 million in costs, really just because of staffing cost increases. So um, there, there you may end up with three point seven um, going into next year. And, and, and I think that you know, it's, it's really, it is really just an unfortunate position that we are all in right now without knowing a number for sure to work with. And even though we have what I think is a reasonably good number to run with at this point, probably the best number we have. Um, once the session is over, I've, you know, unfortunately it's kind of too late for next year, um, but hopefully we have a really good sense at least of the next year. And I think just, just to impress upon you that, um, I think it's really important, you know, if, if we knew, if, if you knew, what the number was next year for sure. I think this conversation would be different. I think we'd be, you know, this would, the discussions would be different. The uncertainty is just really throws a wrench in things. Once we get to this, the session over, and hopefully we definitely know a number for that following year, um, you know, it's that 2.7 is still a big number. Based on what I showed you, it's something that the district likely could absorb. Um, fortunately, um, but but I really I feel like that next year, um, if you have a definite number, that the conversations may have to be different on your side. AJ, what's um, AJ just on your on your staffing, the the two hundred ten thousand dollar reduction to special assignment teachers and instructional coaches, where was that coming from with grade level? Um, middle school level. So one one at the middle school, one at or, uh, one at Eagle Valley, and one at, at Carson Middle School. Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering, we're in, I'm not saying the target anywhere, but looks like the, the, the lower grades are taking the hits to achieve this. Was it conscious that we didn't want to do anything at the high school level or? Um, not necessarily, and I, I think the, you know, as we were going through this, um, there were there were some positions uh, that maybe stood out more as opportunities than others, or, or just kind of more obvious considerations. I think fr from our standpoint, and and I, so like the the elementary ELAISs, they aren't those those positions aren't going away. It's just that they're not general funded. So that that is not, as far as what they're performing at the elementary schools, those would stay. Um, the positions that were kind of the read by three positions, those were the ones that the board granted under the contingency authority earlier in the year because of the, the mess we had with NDE. Um, and, and the understanding at that point is that they, they really would only be one year positions I think unless really something significant changed and nothing came up during the year. So, um, and then the, as far as the, the two teachers um, at the bottom, that really is, it, it goes back to the class size ratios and the standard that we just have that we're, we're held to statutorily. So um, it, it, there wasn't necessarily, I don't know, Ms. Kimmett, did you want to say that all? 
kind of making sense. Susan Kima, for the record, in addition, what's not up there is with the Read by Three grant, the four title schools each get an interventionist. So there's positions they're getting that are not in here because they weren't part of the general fund in the first place. So are, those, then, are those two interventionists for Fritch and Seeliker then? Those positions that are... The, the two that are up there, um, one is uh, at Mark Twain and the other is at Borderwick. And, and so if, if with the grant funding interventionist positions for next year, it's possible that those folks end up interviewing and getting into those positions for the new year. So, um, so there's those considerations when you're saying these positions are in a position, can can um, go away, and then there's the people person part of that. So like like he's saying, with the two read by three TOSA interventionists that the board allowed to use general fund money for one year, the position will go away from the general fund, but because of the read by three grant, the position will remain just with a different funding source. And then, of course, because it was a one-year-only position, people would have to interview. So there's there's some of those kinds of things that are going on as grants come out that we are able to look at the needs of the elementary, look at the needs of the middle schools, look at the needs of the high schools. Um, and then, of course, always want to work on alignment, K-12, um, to, to make our decisions. And the same with the... Uh, you mentioned those paras. They're supposed to be um, a request in for additional money for Read by Three, but we don't know what that's going to be and if there's going to be anything that comes of that. But there could be at the very end, and then we can put back looking at the needs of our schools. So, two questions on that line. So I'm assuming the way what I heard you say was that Fritch and Seeliger might have a, a learning strategist or implementation <coughs> specialist that they share with another site. Is that what you're saying? Because it's they're going the title schools are gonna be grant funded. So those elementary, um, the elementary implementation specialists for ELA, they used to be the success for all facilitators, then they became implementation specialists during the race to the top. Read by grade three calls them learning strategists. So there's going to be a name change, but it's that position. We were awarded a certain amount of grant money. One of our schools did not get a learning strategist. We talked to the state and said, could we, instead of having um, more interventionists, could we make sure that each one of our schools does have a learning strategist. The state said yes. So we'll have six elementary schools with six ELA learning strategists in their positions to help it because it's by required by law that we're expected to carry out the requirements of read by three and they allowed us to kind of shift the funding. That reduced one of the interventionists. So we made the decision that the interventionists would be assigned to our lowest performing schools, which are the four two-star schools. So and then the other question is, so what about the math and science strategists and what impact do those have on the budget? So as far as Susan Kima for the record, as far as the general fund, they did not have any impact because they were in the Great Teachers Leaders Grant. And that grant, um, the, the state changes the priorities um, every two years. And, you know, for six years, there was, or, you know, or so they were, it was math, science, and STEM. Now the priorities are changing. So those, pe those people have been talked to. Um, they know that that grant's going away and that, we're not going to make matters worse with the general fund by trying to fold them in. So they know that the position's gone. So that kind of answers my question. I guess I'm just trying to get to, of these reductions, are we anticipating that we have spots for 
these employees. Absolutely, that's, yes. That's what I'm trying to get. Yes. At. Yeah, that's yes. correct. And some principals that have title funding are considering whether they feel they should have a math science person on staff in order to support their teachers. They're making those decisions as individual sites. But there will be positions for them. Richard? One of the goals for the school board nationally is to provide quality education to all the students in the district. But we've got to be fiscally responsible in doing that. So I'm wondering, this is an awful big number, uh, $2.7 million, uh, $3.7 million next year. What's the possibility of uh, lessening the cuts we have to make next year and maybe go a little bit further this year with reductions? So if, if we were to go further with reductions, um, I, I, I don't, we could certainly cut more um, from some supply budgets, um, but I think just you know, just the example that if you're cutting five percent saves you about two hundred thousand dollars. There, there's not um, there's not a whole lot there that we can go after. So, um, I think the the reality is that if you decide to go um, looking for larger savings, there's going to be more impact to staffing to to make that happen. I don't think there's really a way around it. Um, if you and and it's a good point if if you um, I mean, if you looked at doing that this year, it, it you know reduces the deficit this year, and then that lower deficit is already in place in the new year. So, um, from that standpoint, it um, it, it kind of helps the cause already going into the next year. Um, otherwise, if, if you if you don't do that this year, then you're you're absorbing more of a loss this year, but then you realize more. Um, um, some more uh, reduction of the deficit in the next year. Mike? Just kind of on that same note, and I think that one of the things we talked about last time is there's so many unknowns that I think we'd be really foolish to do that because it's going to impact staff, and those staff members are going to be absorbed by a neighboring district because there's vacancies everywhere, and you're not going to get them back. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that, like we talked about last time, we want to – be conservative enough to make the cuts we need to be responsible to our community, but also we don't want to gut the school district of its talent or really hamper the instructional programs to the to where we can't really recover. And so I think that with as many unknowns as we have right now, I think we would be really foolish to do that. I, and that's just my opinion. And I think that we need to get this document out there and get people knowing that this is what the Department of Education's numbers are. It hurts nine of the counties significantly. And and make sure that legislators know this, make sure that the community is talking about it, make sure that you know we we're, we're we're we I think we as a community need to be the squeaky wheel that here here's here's this session where they're supposed to improve education funding and we're getting hit and and that you know they maybe they maybe they can change it maybe they they now have a superintendent at NDE so maybe something will change but I think I think that's where we would need teachers staff citizens students everybody to 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 be aware of this and to um, become I guess active I'm, I'm not sure where I you know, looking at those figures, I don't know how Lander would even have a school district. Say, so might have school districts. <laughs> they'd have to be absorbed. But I think that um, I'm more behind Mike. We've we've been through these before, not quite as many unknowns through the budget cycles. But it, like I said at the beginning, I don't want to start causing any chaos by looking at it. I think by the time we get these next numbers, we'll have a little better effort, and by June, we'll know. And I think also, I mean, that's why we had the strategic plan and the community working on those so that we have that, that pattern. And if we do need to cut more in the next one, then I think that's when we can go back to the, the working group and, and get some feedback from the community and the educators of where they think 
they have to be cut instead of putting it all on staff too. So I think if we have to go any deeper, I think that would be the next way that I, I'd like to go. But I think there's too many unknowns right now to, to take that into consideration. I do want to... Yeah, <laughs> we're talking about people's livelihoods, and we're talking about community livelihoods, too. I mean, there's a lot of people who live here and work here, and and that's important. Um, the other thing I would like to eliminate with this presentation, as he said at the next meeting, you're going to have the actual tentative budget to look at. So I would hope that you will take the time over the weekend to look and see if you have any of the concerns with numbers and stuff that you go and talk to AJ before that so that he has figures that he can look at and come back with with any concerns that you guys might have too. Um, just so that it's not we're bringing up something and AJ has to say, well, I'll have to get back to you. So if, if you have any of those concerns and stuff, if you could just contact him, um, be more than able to help them and and that'll help us proceed with that that meeting too. So we can get a lot more done since that'll be the last one before we actually submit the budget. So maybe maybe bring AJ some Advil with us. Yeah. <laughs> bring AJ something to get through it. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. I th I think what you've laid out tonight based on our request is kind of where we want to be. I want to be at this point. I mean, I minimal staffing impacts. The staff that is impacted, you know, kind of get reshuffled into a different place in the deck, if you will. So, that, I mean, that's positive. You know, we're not sending anybody off on their way. And, and, and I say that because I agree. There's so much we don't know yet that, you know, this this gets us in a place where, you know, we, we, we you know we, we can deal with it. And if we have to, you know, if it gets worse and we have to make bigger cuts, we'll know more at that time and we can do that. But I think, you know, I, I don't want to send panic to anybody or let the or let them think at a board level we're looking at just slashing positions, you know, prematurely. So and don't you think? I think, and I kind of feel like we've been looking at these for as long as I've been on the board. I mean, and I think that this is the ongoing discussion that not just our school board is having, but our entire state is having, and it's how education is funded in our state and the deficiencies and the challenges school boards have in meeting those needs and so i think that i know it feels uncomfortable because i think none of us want to be looking at those numbers i think that it's also a juggling act and we're all trying to advocate for education and then just stay one step ahead and i think that's the challenge that all of us face and luckily we have aj as the as the leader of that crew <laughs> so does that give you mr stokes and mr feeling enough direction to go ahead? Or are there any questions that you have for us? Not <clears throat> Madam President, not really a, a question, but more of a statement. Um, one of the things that hasn't been talked about that I know you're all aware of is the, the deadline that we have to get contracts signed with our teachers, which we provide letters of intent by May 1. And uh, once we cross that threshold with that number of teachers, then we're locked in for the following year. So, so even though we have a, a deadline of April 15th for our tentative budget, it's, it's only half a month, two more weeks, and, and we have to make decisions one way or another with our teaching staff uh, as it applies to their um, their contracts. So that's just one more little wrinkle to keep in the back of your mind as we move forward. So uh, I think I think we understand the intent of the board. Um, and of course, as time goes on, we'll continue to monitor and, and hopefully we'll have some impact as um, we meet with our colleagues and we band together. I know NASB has been involved and uh, we hope uh, all of the associations with their respective uh, lobbying strength can also impact what's going on at the legislature this year. And we'll, uh, it, it, it's an interesting year, it really is, to, uh, to be watching what's going on, but it's also pretty scary. Thank you. Any other further comments? Any comments from the public? Seeing none, thank you, AJ, and good luck. <laughs> Moving on to number 11. Drive on, oh. It's not for us or for him. <laughs> it's for all of us. 
Good luck getting us money, AJ. That's what she's telling Moving me. on to number 11, approval of the consent agenda for possible action. So moved. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Laurel. Any other discussion by the board? Any public comment? Seeing none. Uh, motion is approved. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is after 9 o'clock. We have cut that from our budget. No cut more votes. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay, moving on to number 12, informational items for discussion only. I'm sure you've read them. If you have any questions, please ask Mr. Stokes. <coughs> moving on to number 13, request for future agenda topics. We're all pretty consumed by the budget. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. We'll have other ones in July. <laughs> Seeing none, I move for adjournment. Thank you all. <laughs> Have a good night.